Good day, everybody. Sure, I'm happy to introduce myself. So, today I'll be continuing from what my previous speaker spoke about innovation and entrepreneurship, and that there's a difference between innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Although they are connected and they're interdependent upon one another, they're actually different things. And to continue in the last point that he mentioned, that we have to start remembering that there's a greater world out there with ideas happening. And unless we take those ideas on board, we're going to get, and which we're in right now, believing that the world is only 5,000 people. The world is not only 5,000 people, the world is outside of Mansoor and we operate within that space. So, we start off, what do you see? Most people, as I'm listening, see a black dot in the middle of the screen. But there's a, there's more than a diagram on the black dot, there's an entire white space outside of the black dot. So most of the other speakers have spoken and will be speaking about the black dot. I'll be speaking about the white space about around the black dot that we keep forgetting about. So the light bulb was invented by a guy called Thomas Edison, if you remember our stuff from school and National Geographic, etc. And basically pass electricity through a, a material to get what it heats up and it creates light. He needed to find what kind of materials can be used without burning out. And he tried over a thousand materials. And somebody came to him and said, you tried over a thousand materials, you'll fail. And his answer was, I have failed, I've discovered a thousand things that do not work. And from that, he, he was one of the most prolific inventors and innovators in American history. He went on to form a company that we now know as General Electric, which is one of the largest conglomerates of turbines, city scans, etc. We'll come back to the G story later. So the question is, why are we studying innovation and why is it important to us and why do we have this conference? It cannot be a simple matter of because we're here to talk, but it basically boils down to the fact that we're trying to create a sustainable monster of social economic change in the country. Basically trying to figure out how to make money and how do you do that through innovation and through business. So I did a little check and I tried to look at the Caribbean and the other countries and I realized that the American, the first world countries, their GDP is growing faster than the Caribbean islands in general. So I'm starting the Caribbean. It's growing faster than the Caribbean countries in general. If you look at the other small island developing states, they're also right now growing faster than the Caribbean in general. And you sort of try to ask, why is this? There are various reasons. One of the reasons that the economists discovered it is productivity gap. The difference in productivity between the Caribbean and these other countries accounts for a large part of the difference. It is not factor accumulation. It is not a matter of finances. It is not a matter of access to money. It is not a matter of how much human capital that they have. That is even around the small island developing states. The difference is, is the productivity. The productivity in the Caribbean is very low. One of the things that increases productivity in your company, in your business, is innovation and innovation, innovative ideas. So if we want to grow our economy and we want to grow our country, we have to figure out how to get innovative companies, how to get innovative ideas and the companies that we currently have in the Caribbean and Montserrat, which we're really interested in. How do we get innovative ideas? How do we get innovative things to do? So we increase the productivity, increase the value of the company, get more resources, get more money, which is basically the point. However, businesses are very small. They are normally older. They're less involved in foreign trade. And they're mostly concentrated in tourism and retail sectors. That's mostly what our businesses are in the Caribbean. And you look around Montserrat. That's basically where we are. There's a government and there's a set of services that they are to provide products and services to government workers. This is how most of the economy is structured. Aid comes in, the government workers need to eat to their supermarket restaurants and their services that are offered to the government workers. And then there's a small tourist sector, which was discussed in a different talk. So we basically 
predominantly tourism and retail sectors. But this kind of system is not one for dynamism. It is not one that will create innovative ideas and it is not one that will generate social economic change. So we have to move beyond the black dot and to see what's on the canvas outside of this black dot which we've been operating on in the last 20 years. And it's a very important number right here from Mohan in 2014, he did some a study and he found that just 11% of the firms in the region that were surveyed engaged in any type of innovation, innovative innovation activity. So only 10% of the Caribbean firms that you look at was looking at some kind of innovation activity and we start to realize that there's a problem which I hope will come up in this talk this afternoon on education. It's a different talk altogether. But there's something happening below why we don't have a society that looks at innovation, innovative type activities and we basically <coughs> reproduce what the North and the which of first world countries do. I will skip to this, but so we're doing innovation and we're looking at businesses. Our innovation is not the same as this previous speaker said. It could be a process, it could be a product, it could be from the organization, it could be from the society. And even in general, you could have, you have a problem that's not well defined and you don't even know where the problem lies. You have things like basic research, we have different types of disruptive innovation and there are different ways that we go about solving them. Some of these things we will never be able to do in some sense. We will never be able to have multi-billion and multi-million dollar labs that do some of the basic research that's done in the other first world countries, etc. So some of these things we can't say that that's not for us. There are certain things that we can do in terms of disruptive innovation and going to it and in terms of sustaining innovation for some of the companies that already exist. So those are things that we can do and I'm getting to later. I'm just going to go through this quickly because, as again, as the previous speaker mentioned, innovation doesn't only apply to businesses but also to organizations, to government, to civic society, etc. And there was a survey done of 100 businesses to try to find out what are the characteristics of these businesses that cause them to be innovative and to come up with new stuff. I want the first six basic things they found. I want the first one is the most important one, purposefulness. You must have a clear idea of why you're doing what you're doing and it can't just be money. So there's something that drives companies, there's something that drives Google, we're going to collect all the world's information, there's something that drives Facebook, we're going to connect the world together, there's something that, there's a culture of Apple, if you look in the ads and how they operate, Separate from the concept that we're going to make money, there's something deeper why we're doing something. So if we're claiming that maybe our city service is not as innovative as they should be, do they have a clear purpose of why they're doing what they're doing? When our students are studying, do they have a clear purpose or idea why are they studying these things? The next one is experimentation. You must be willing to try new ideas. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over. Somebody will come on top of you and kill you, which is what well, didn't really happen in the most of context because in some sense in our businesses we lack competition. Part of our businesses were legacy businesses from people before with money and land. When we start looking at the business landscape in Monster, it is changing with the new younger players entering the market in all sectors, supermarket, hardware, etc. and it's driving a change in the older businesses you now see renovating and trying new stuff. It is now happening, live right now. Empowerment, again, there must be a clear path to the change. You have to look beyond your business for different ideas, not just in your specific space. So although in the supermarket industry, there are things happening in the tech industry which may affect you. You're in the creative industry and you're creating music. There are things that are happening in the creative industry in terms of Spotify, iTunes, etc which have moved away from the creator CD, go to a label type of model that we know before. And so you have to look beyond the space that you're in, otherwise things are going to happen. Take out the work from underneath you and you're going to wonder what happened. You have to collaborate, which is a problem that we have in the Caribbean and in Montserrat specifically, that our businesses do not collaborate with one another. 
but you're going to have the finances individually to accomplish certain things, so we're always restricted. And you see it in the nature of businesses in Montserrat, especially the businesses are named after the owner, which tells you something the business is me. If you look at the business names throughout Montserrat, a lot of them just take the owner's name. It's not a separate entity. From the owner, the business is the owner. So it makes the idea of collaboration and work with other people from the inception, you know, it's going to be a problem. Then yeah, there's a refinement of an innovative idea, you carry it out and hopefully things happen. Now, we all know the problems that we have in the Caribbean and a lot of them also related to Montserrat. The actual problems is what's reported. That there's limited government support, there's lack of external financing, there's deficiency of technology and technological knowledge, there's difficulty in accessing accessing the knowledge, there's paucity of knowledge about what market opportunities exist. It's hard to know if you have an idea of what's the market for it. There's only 5,000 people in Montserrat, but what's going on in St. Kitts, St. Lucia, England, etc. Part of that information from here. Limited opportunity for innovation, cooperation, inadequately skilled and knowledgeable labor, force and a lack of sufficient demand. If you invent a new product, a new idea, you want to start a new city. At the beginning, at the inception, you're kind of limited to the 5,000 people. And you really have to do work to get beyond. If I invent a product in New York City, I automatically have access to a bigger market than I have here, so you have these challenges to overcome. And the question is, given all of these challenges, some of which, which cannot be fixed, and will always exist, and we want to have our innovative companies in Montserrat, and we want to do entrepreneurship, and we want to figure out how to create wealth. The question is, what can be done, and what kind of companies, what kind of opportunities can exist that in some sense reduce the effect of some of these problems which will always exist. So if I need a complaint, or you could try and find a solution. And I'm saying that due to the advance of technology, some of these problems no longer exist. But if we go back to things about the lack of deficiency in technical knowledge, we have the internet. Even the difficulty of a labor force, if you're in, for example, you have a business idea and you're trying to build an app, you do not have to look for the programmers in Montserrat. The programmers exist in Eastern Europe, in India, in other places, and you can have access to them. So when people complain they don't have this is science stuff, STEM stuff, you have nothing to do with me. There's two problems with that. Firstly, the apps that you build is not the business, it is the platform on which you're building your business. And if you think about it, if you're building a supermarket, you don't complain, you don't have construction skills, you hire somebody to build the structure. So if you actually had an idea for an app or something, it is not up to you to build it yourself. It is possible to obtain that knowledge elsewhere, there are programs and things online where you can contact people and build it. Market opportunities through the App Store and Google Play Store and Spotify and iTunes and Tidal and all these other, the market is there. You still have marketing to compete with everybody that is there. But you kind of have an idea of what your market is and it's not dependent upon the 5,000 people in Montserrat. Those opportunities exist. So all these things like lack of sufficient demand, accessing knowledge, etc. A lot of those have been negated in some sense because of the advent of the internet. In terms of financing for businesses before to start the business was highly expensive, capital intensive. Because of the advance of the internet, you can start certain businesses and the capital requirements are lower and in some sense not even here. It's a matter of how much time you're willing to invest into it. And the Caribbean missed the opportunity when the internet first came out. We've got a second opportunity where everything gets compact into the mobile space and mobile phones took over, where you could have created certain business ideas and apps based upon the compactification of the internet in a little device, which again did not require some of these capital intensive things and access to the knowledge. And again, the Caribbean and Montserrat missed that opportunity because we have this idea of saying that these things exist, but they exist in the external world and they do these things and then we get them and then we use them. The idea that, we, that this is where the trends are going, which is what you pointed out, we have to see where things are going. Maybe we knew, but we never took advantage of it. 
So my question is, what are the new trends that are now existing that will create opportunity for Montserrat, which we are again ignoring? And what do we, how can we take advantage of these? There are a couple, but there are four ones that I think applies to us. Machine learning, virtual reality, augmented reality, and blockchain. And we are going to construct the rest of this talk. Is to some of these things sound high tech and far away and have nothing to do with us. And I'm saying that 10, some of us are old enough or young enough, so I want to look at it. Do you remember when the internet started and when it was this high magnificent thing and now it's commonplace? Some of us remember when cell phones first came out and they were this high tech item and they are now commonplace. 10 years later, we do not see them as high tech and as something out there. And I'm saying 10 years from now, we're not going to see these things as high tech and out there. They're just going to be part of our everyday being. And the question is, are we going to let other people develop these ideas or are we going to do something about them? I'm going to skip machine learning because I haven't really done anything on that and it's more technical, intensive, in a different kind of way. So I, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to do the, the other three as it relates to Montserrat specifically. For those of you all that don't know, virtual reality is you basically put a headset on and it creates a virtual world around you, tracks your head movement, so when you look around or look anything, you're actually in the space because it creates the 3D world there for you in virtual space. So, this is our capital, Plymouth, as is now, covered over with ash, etc. I see more covered than had this photo has it. And the, the person I asked myself, is there some way for us to see what Plymouth looked like before this event occurred? Is there some, so I'm not trying to solve an entrepreneurship problem, or I'm trying to solve anything in a simple question. Is there some people are saying that, your new generation tourists that come, yes, they see the destruction, but they, they see the pictures before, but they don't have an idea of how it looked like before. So the question I ask, is there a way to get that done? And I realize you know we can create a virtual reality experience where we create the entire capital so that people can put in the headset and literally walk through town. So I've got a bunch of four guys, they found the company, Fourth Dimension. They looked at all pictures like this one, by looking at people standing next to the building, you can get the height of the building. By looking at cars, you can get the length of the building. You can make certain architectural choices and get an idea of how big the building should be based on how things scale, etc. So we took pictures, videos, etc. And from that, after three months, we created, we have created Marine Drive in Plymouth. The company has done it, and this is a screenshot out of the system. And the reason I'm showing it is to point out that the things I'm talking about are not out there, these things were done here. So this was actually done, and some of you all have actually experienced it, and it has gotten a lot of great reviews. So you can actually go into, put on a headset, and literally walk to Plymouth. The idea exists, so that's just a creative idea. But then you realize there are entrepreneurship and business ideas that can come out of it in terms of two operators, when people come and they're wanting to go to Plymouth, they might also be willing to pay to see how the capital was, etc. So there's a business model that can be developed around this product. And it's, I don't believe this exists any other place in the Caribbean, and we have done it with over 5,000 people. So the question is going to be, how can you export this kind of business skill, this kind of business idea, outside of the 5,000 people of Montserrat? But these innovations are here, and we have done it. And this is one example of it. So an example, when Lord Army came to visit, he experienced it. He was so impressed with it that he went and did a Twitter thing on it. One of the guys that came with him was so impressed with what was happening that he's in discussion with the guys about how to move forward, etc. So those opportunities exist, and they don't exist in some far off space. The things that we can do, and we are not limited by capital, government support, external markets, and all these other things that we complain about because we love complaining. The guys are now working on an actual game. This is a screenshot from it, which they plan eventually to put on the Nintendo Switch. And it may sound a far-off idea, 
but you need moonshot ideas because these young kids watching Neil Armstrong and them landing on the moon inspire them as a nation that we can do things. So they are currently working on that. So after three weeks, they have made a certain kind of progress. And here you can, this is an early prototype. You can see some young kids already engaging with it and starting to have in their head, maybe this is something we can do also. So that has happened. The next idea is augmented reality. I don't know if you know what this is. Don't know the Pokemon go. You need to keep up with the kids. Augmented reality is the idea that you have the reality in front of you and we are going to augment it. In other words, we're going to create digital objects that exist in this space. So in other words, you can take your phone and you look to your phone at this spot and I can place a couch in this space. Not just in this picture, it's going to appear anything. So to actually walk around, it's going to be literally appear as it is there. So you have to walk around and it makes things appear there. You think about the opportunities in retail, in driving around, that you could see what things appear over the buildings to say what they are. Even they're not working on technologies that you put on the glasses and it, so it's always there. So when you're driving, instead of looking down on your GPS, you would actually see on the road in front of you the path and where to turn. You would just project it onto the retina of your eye. So that already exists. And it's going to be, every prediction says that it's a new wave, it's going to be huge, it's where we are going. It's what's going to happen. And the question is, are we going to wait for the people to do it and then join it, or are we going to be part of it? And here you see a bunch of young kids who are currently working with us. And what you have here is one of the group leader presenting his idea of a virt of an augmented reality application that he wants to develop. So that is currently happening in the form of a you want a kind of semi incubator type of thing. So these are the young kids presenting that and they're high school children. So it's not a far out thing or there is something that we can do if we're willing to restructure our education system, etc., to take advantage of these opportunities and stop complaining. The final one is something called blockchain. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's connected to Bitcoin, which uses blockchain, but it's not the same thing. Blockchain basically solves the problem of two problems. If you, for example, I want to transfer money from one strap to somebody in America, how do you do it? You do it through a bank, or you do it through PayPal, or some of these services. So you're always doing it to a third party who verifies who you are, who verifies who the other person is, and then let the transaction occurs. The bank also keeps a track of how much money you have in some record, some place, and you trust the bank to maintain that record for you. So there's also a third party which has a cost to do certain type of transactions. Blockchain solved the problem. It is now possible for between you and the person directly without the third party to do the transaction in a secure way and the items are stored in a ledger which cannot be changed. So you guarantee that the transactions that you do are immutable, that we, for all practical purposes, it cannot be messed with. So you guarantee that without the middle man. So those technologies are coming and it's going to revolutionize finance and it's going to revolutionize things like digital music that you could trade, digital assets, things like government in terms of land deeds and who owns what and transferring property. It is now possible through an application to this technology to store that information without the third party and the information cannot be changed. How it works is a different talk, but we could discuss that, but it works. So there's something called Blockchain, and the question is, okay, that's a new idea as far out. Can we do in Montserrat anything to take advantage of this? I don't even know the guy in the middle. The guy in the middle is my brother, Daniel Joseph. He just got his doctorate, and we were the original founders of Lavis, a software company. He's at a conference here. He currently holds and has applied for nine different patents on blockchain technology. And when he was here at there was a conference in Switzerland to discuss one of the ideas they have about how do you have voting based upon the blockchain. And he has applied for 
patents, one of the nine patents he has applied for. So that has been done by a local person. But we have a problem in Montserrat that we do not understand where the world is going, and we have another serious problem that we do not understand what we have. And even when we understand what we have, we do not understand how to utilize it. So that capacity exists, so it's a capacity problem that is not there. It's there and he has five patents, etc. So it is a matter of now, can you use those patents to develop applications around to get things done? So that was that was done. And in the finance sector, because of the invention of blockchain, I now have new financial technology companies coming. What they have done is to change the laws from the Financial Services Commission to allow financial companies and firms, fintech firms, to register in Gibraltar. So you have BBI and them not going out to the same problem of the public registry problem. You can make a lot of their money from registering overseas companies. So this was in 2017. They realized that this is what's going to happen and they've already changed their legislation in such a way that if these financial technical companies want to register, because a lot of legislation, first the banks, etc. It's possible to change our laws here so that these new financial companies that are using the blockchain, etc., can start registering here and we collected that revenue. But the opportunity again is going to pass us because we don't want to do anything about it. That's how we operate. And Willa has already started to change their laws and their cities in Switzerland that are specifically starting now to set up to deal with the registration of blockchain and financial technical companies. BVI does it, Cayman does it for fight for other financial services, Turks and Caicos does it for financial services. We are British overseas territories. If we are serious and we're looking for innovative ideas, we can go into that space, just change our laws, etc., and seek out these companies to register. So the question, what are we doing about it? And then to wrap up, there's some very fam famous things that we're blockchain famous that people know about is Bitcoin. It's basically a digital currency, but that's not the point right now. For the Bitcoin ecosystem to work, it consumes a lot of energy from the way how we have to verify the transactions, etc. There's a process called mining and technical details are important, but it consumes a lot of energy. Right now, the entire Bitcoin network consumes more energy than Austria. So it's going to a country than Iceland, etc. And look at Bitcoin current estimate energy consumption that's in terawatts, which is a thousand billion watts. It's 73.12. We use 2 megawatts in one cell, which is 2 million watts. That's the amount of energy it consumes, and as you look at the graph, as we go along the network, it's going to consume more and more energy. So these miners are looking for opportunities where they have energy sources to set up operations. And if you look at the back bottom line, the carbon footprint per transaction, kilogram, is 456 kilograms. So every transaction generates 456 kilograms of carbon. So it is creating a big environmental discussion about this technology is not sustainable because it gets bigger and bigger. You require more and more energy and you're creating more and more greenhouse gases. So these companies that do the mining are looking for opportunities. So what does this have to do with Montserrat? The current cost of Bitcoin is around $6,000. moves every day, right? So, if you can generate through your mining, because the process for mining to generate a Bitcoin, and it costs you in some sense less than $6,000, you're going to make a profit. And so let's start with Trinidad and Tobago. If you look at the first cheap electricity because of the natural resources, etc. Trinidad and Tobago at the current estimate is going to cost them about $1,190 US to generate a Bitcoin. So Trinidad and Tobago was serious about that. They can attract these companies. They can set up in Trinidad and Tobago. They can use the cheap electricity. They can do the mining and then the government can so sort of work out how do you derive revenue from that. And they ask, what does that have to do with Montserrat? Because we know that we have a geothermal energy source. We know that we can generate electricity without this carbon footprint. And the question is, are we willing to engage? First, do we know who these miners are? 
are we willing to engage with these miners to use our technology and our green energy to generate the electricity required for the uh, mining? And even if they're only at a break even for their mining, can they now, in some sense, sell the excess energy to our local market at a lower cost than what we currently have to generate a profit? And this is an opportunity that exists out there. And the question is, are we going to let it pass by because we hear about these things and we say, yes, they can work, but we're never actually serious about pursuing them because we're so concentrated on the little black dot in the middle of the screen when the uh, opportunity is out there. So I started with GE. Now, GE became one of the world's largest companies manufacturing city scans, power generators, aircraft, jet engine, etc. A lot of management courses came out of GE to Jack Relch, how they run the programs, etc. They were one of the most efficient companies in terms of innovation, in terms of coming up with new products, in terms of process engineering, how do you generate new jet engine ideas and develop it for millions of dollars on the cheap. Because they cut a lot of money, how do you cut down development costs? They want the best at it. And right now, the, the technologies are some of the best. They are some of the most innovative. This is GE's stock price over the past year. GE is collapsing. GE has lost, market cap has lost over 120 billion dollars. And the question is why? GE invested a lot of money in natural gas power stations, etc. Green energy is now where the world is going. And because the cost of green energy in terms of solar, etc., is dropping, GE has invested a lot of innovation, a lot of ideas into a technology that will no longer be useful. So it is possible to innovate so successfully that you innovate yourself out of business. So we have to be careful about where the world is going and how we position ourselves that we don't get caught in the black dot and innovate ourselves out of business.